Welcome to 101st International Women's Day. Following several campaigns and marches demanding for rights and peace, the first International Women's Day was observed in 1911. Year on year, International Women's Day is certainly increasing in status. The United States even designates the whole month of March as Women's History Month. Today's topic, Asian women in UK, identity and alienation. The immigrant women, whom contrary to much of the literature, are not passive, silent young women who are caught between two cultures and confused about their identity. On the contrary, they are very active, articulate creators and constructors of a dynamic, fluid sense of identity. In interaction with work and social life in a multicultural society, they shift and negotiate their identity positions to create a space for themselves. They consciously choose how they will present and represent themselves within family, in the community, and to the outside world. They must constantly mediate and negotiate their identities in that newly created space. The experiences of women in employment, direct and indirect institutional racism, poor access to services and information, or unsuitable services, difficulty arising from difference in culture, religion, and language experience can be interpreted as alienating. Woman is like a liquid. A liquid, when poured into a mouth, takes the shape of a mouth without losing its properties and identity. Similarly, women, irrespective of where they are, in parents' house, in in-laws' home, in their home country, or anywhere in the world, can be successful without losing their own identity and culture. Among such women are a distinguished guest who achieved great success in their lives by overcoming many barriers. Therefore, I request our beloved guests to share their experiences with us this evening. Not the least, my advice to all of you present here is, let's make a difference. Think globally and act locally. Make every day an International Women's Day. Do your bit to ensure that the future of women is bright, equal, safe, and rewarding. Thank you. I would like to request Professor Nirmala Rao to introduce the topic to the gathering. <coughs> Professor Nirmala Rao is Pro Director, Learning and Teaching at the School of Oriental and African Studies. She has published extensively in the field of urban governance and has served as an advisor to a range of bodies, including the UK Audit Commission and the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister. <coughs> Professor Nirmala Rao. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to contribute to today's session. I should like to begin by thanking the organizers for putting together such an impressive uh, event. It is a hugely important topic and an issue uh, which we've um, been grappling and will continue to do so for some time to come. And although it's heartening to see uh, some real progress being made in various fields of professional activity to bring greater integration and equality, I think there's still much to be done in the coming years. I think the organizers of today's event have asked me to introduce the topic by giving some uh, personal reflections. Um, I've also been told to introduce the the esteemed um, panelists um, who are with me today, which I think I shall begin by introducing and then offer some um, reflections about my life and, and the topic in general. Um, I'd like to start by introducing Badness Rusha Prashad of Randmeet. It's absolutely delightful to see Rusha here um, on the stage. Uh, I met her some 20 years ago, I think, and we've um, not seen each other since then. That was the time when I just around in the country. I just completed my PhD and we met each other through my supervisor who has played a very important role in my life about which I'm telling you uh, when I offer my personal reflections. But Baroness um, Prashad of Rajmi, born in Kenya, came to the UK in the 1960s. She obtained her first degree in BA politics from Leeds University and postgraduate studies in social administration at the University of Glasgow. Since the 1970s, she served either as a director or chair, chairwoman of a variety of public and private sector organizations. Appointed a civil service commissioner in 1990, Badness Prashad was the first civil service commissioner from August 2000 to 2005. She was appointed CBE in 1994 and was made a life peer in 1999 as Badness Prashad of Ranamit in the county of Sunday. 
Lady Prashad was chairman of the National Literacy Trust from 2001 to 2005, trustee of the BBC World Service Trust in 2002, and president of the Royal Commonwealth Society for years. She was appointed as chairman of the Judicial Appointments Commission in September 2005. Baroness Prashad has also served on the Iraq Inquiry. We also have Lady Shruti Rana here, again a very old friend who was a former master for only two years. What is that in that term? Um, Lady Rana is an internationally renowned musician, a scholar and documentary filmmaker. A key figure positioned at the forefront of educational research, Lady Shruti works with practitioners and institutions to establish new paradigms for integral education. She is currently involved in international education, working at the Ministry of Human Resource Development in India, Indira Gandhi National Open University in India, and other institutions globally for evolving faculty training, evaluation, accreditation formats, and policies and new curriculum developments. Lady Rana has worked extensively with integral methodologies for wellness through sound and music. She has conducted scientific studies into the effects of seed sounds on human physiology. In recognition of her contribution to the realm of healing music, Lady Shruti was awarded the Delhi Ratna Government of India Award in 2022. Founder and managing trustee of Shruti Foundation, a charitable trust established in 2006, Lady Rana is committed to championing the causes of education, wellness, and human rights. Her foundation produces a range of audiovisual educational materials for public awareness. She convened the first World Education Culture Congress in New Delhi in January 2011, involving 40 countries, which was organized by Shruti Foundation. She had also co-convened the World Congress on Psychology and Spirituality in 2008 with 40 countries. In April 2009, she launched the Shruti Foundation International Lecture Series with the objective of encouraging global awareness and knowledge of Indian ways of knowledge, education and empowerment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome Badness Prashnad and Lady Shruti Rana, who will be speaking and offering their personal reflections on the topic uh, when I finish with mine. As I said, the organizers had asked me to introduce the topic. I warned them that it would be extremely dangerous for me as an academic to introduce the topic, because I'm sure you all know by now, academics are not really known to be real world people. They're sitting in ivory towers, um, writing books and articles. Um, I'm very good at constructing what I call high-octane theories about concepts such as identity or alienation, which have very little relevance or meaning to real world. Um, so when I said I'm not really fit to speak on the topic, um, uh, Mr. Gandhi said, come and say, you know, talk about women and um, equality issues and and uh, generally on the topic, and I thought I should take this opportunity to provide you with my own personal life experiences since coming to the country in 1984. And as I said, I'll speak largely from my experience as someone who's worked in the field of higher education in this country for the past 20 years. But just reflect for a moment on the concept of identity and alienation. The thing is we understand the identity is a term generally used to describe a person's conception and expression of one's individuality or group affiliation. So we refer, we have something like cultural identity, religious identity, national identity, and so on. Of course, it would be true to say that our identities are anything but static, because if you put it in the context of how they evolve as we enjoy our childhood or reach adolescence and move from one location to another, build families, have children, find work, look after our elderly parents, all of which form part of our identity quite seamlessly. However, the very concept of identity does suffer from a crisis, and that crisis is normally seen as the onset of alienation, which happens, I think, to most of us at least once if we are lucky in our lifetime. Uh, just to give you an example, women, of course, has been already referred to by um, Kranti, I think, uh, women have migrated to the West uh, from developing countries for centuries now, most of them following their husbands' footsteps or as domestic servants as young girls. Caring seems to have been a dominant profession, almost forming part of their identity, a constant shadow that uh, constant that shadows them as they move continents in search of a better life. While caring for others lends them a sense of identity, the otherness 
brings about a sense of alienation. And both identity and alienation are significant aspects of one's self-constructions. Today we find caring has been replaced with education and women travel and search for better education. And we see this all the time. But any such process of migration and movement involves not only leaving social networks behind, which may or may not be well established, but also includes experiencing at first sense, uh, at first a sense of loss, dislocation, and isolation. And a series of factors in, in the environment combined with levels of stress, the ability to deal with the stress, and ability to root oneself according to one's traits, personality traits, produce either a sense of settling down or a sense of being isolated and alienated. But here in Britain, considerable progress has been made over the past few decades in facilitating greater integration and assimilation of migrant communities, both at workplace and in the society in general. Our equality policies and practices provide us with the context within which we can understand better the problems of alienation. And they also provide the context in which discrimination and disadvantage can be challenged. I think, however, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that any exclusionary barriers and supportive employment practices are experienced at the level of the individual. And it is for the individual, from whichever of these communities, um, any communities they come from, it is for the individual to negotiate the roadblocks and from their own root map to advancement and fair reward. And this is as true of minorities in general as it is true for women. It is the latter about which I want to really focus on in order to illustrate the general point from my own personal experience. Negative stereotypes for women still abound. Despite the success of many admirable women, it is still the case that for many in this culture, women are seen as sentimental, submissive, docile, where men are seen as independent, adventurous, and strong. Culture, that is, social attitudes, beliefs, and shared value system is something we internalize and build into our own worldview. And as a result of these expectations, many women experience low self-esteem, see any progression for themselves as involving conflict with men, perhaps including their own partner at times. Many women have a fear of failure. But more importantly, some have a fear of success. And let me pause for a moment to consider my own trajectory and see in what ways I, I was helped to overcome these stereotypes and cultural norms. I arrived in the UK in 1984, having produced two small children and an MPhil thesis from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. I spent two years at the Policy Studies Institute. This is where Vadnus Misha Prashar um, had worked before I arrived. Working for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, whose chairman, Sir Charles Carter, a Quaker, made it his business to mentor and encourage me. I should stress that I could not do this on my own. I then moved to Queen Mary College, where my next research project also gave me my PhD. And once again, all this would not have been possible, but for the unswerving support I got from my supervisor, Professor Ken Young, who I alluded to earlier. On completing the PhD, I was appointed to a lectureship at Goldsmiths where I rose from lecturer to professor and vice principal of the college between the years 1994 and 2005. But meanwhile, I picked up valuable external experience as a lay member of the Bar Council of the Architects Registration Board and as a non-executive director of a hospital trust. The point I want to make here is encouragement and wise mentoring have enabled me to overcome the hurdles that women particularly come to a different country like myself uh, often face. I mentioned just now the fear of failure and the fear of success. Personally, I had no fear of failure, but I was quite apprehensive about the consequences of success. I'm sure many women here will agree with me. Um, when I say every woman who advances in her career will have encountered men who, friendly at one point, become disgruntled and suspicious as she begins to move on. I was very flattered at first to be designated by so many to be a rising star. But I feared, and quite rightly as it turned out, that as the star rises, new sorts of frictions are encountered. At times, it seemed to me better just to be regarded as somebody with potential, just not to actually realize it. What does it take to succeed? First, accumulating a strong track record. This is partly a matter of qualification and partly a matter of getting the right experience of getting the right grades, 
a foothold in a career. And there are subtle qualifications too, of fitting the expectations of how a future manager or leader should behave and conduct himself. <coughs> Above all, success in the private or the public sector requires us to demonstrate very strong commitment, which often translates into long hours traveling, perhaps overseas, as well as working at home on the weekends. All of which leads to considerable stress for ourselves and our families. There are other requirements as well. In order to progress, women may have to be mobile, which often can be very difficult to us. Continuous employment is also very difficult and very important for career progression. But in spite of having sympathetic policies and helpful legislation, it remains the case that women who take time out to have children do fall back several rungs on the ladder. Over the last few decades, there has been a great deal of change in legislation and management practices in the adoption of equality policies and in the choices that individuals themselves are making. It would be surprising if universities were immune to these wider patterns of inequality or indeed to the trends in policy and practice that seek to tackle them. Of course they are not. Higher education now has quite a good record in the adoption of equality policies and arrangements for more careful consideration of individuals' entry into and progress through the system. Much of this has come from spontaneous developments within higher education institutions. Some has been there and encouraged by national bodies, including the unions and the funding council. The funding council has established equality aims for the sector and it seeks to <coughs> build an equality and fair treatment irrespective of race, gender, sexual orientation, race, religion, and so on, into a whole range of their policies and initiatives. But, there's a big but here, the underrepresentation of women, the pay gap between men and women for similar work, and the underrepresentation of women and minorities in higher management positions continues to be a problem in the sector. And some of the statistics are not very encouraging. Only 54%, well, 54% of the workforce in higher education are women across all groups. 10% uh, of staff um, are from BME backgrounds. 5% um, of staff are black and minority ethnic women. While 19% of professorial staff are women, only 1% of professorial staff are, are black and minority women. So we're talking about a very, very small figure here. Uh, and the mean gender pay gap is about 20%. So to sum up, most of the issues I think I've touched upon are uh, particularly pertinent to uh, minority women. I've not touched upon Asian women as such because I think the sector I work in, we have so little, very little data pertaining to Asian women um, at all levels. Um, and there are hardly any in the professorial counter. But it would be wrong to oversimplify and the dilemmas and challenges that we confront are ultimately, I think, uh, those that we experience and we have to overcome as individuals. I'm sure today in our discussions, you know, we'll find uh, my colleagues here will have their own reflections, they'll touch upon these and other issues, and um, we can consider what can be done to map out the route to success and remove the roadblocks that um, impede us in our position. Thank you.